Success against the coronavirus pandemic as very fragile with little room for maneuver. And she stressed that any further relaxation of restrictions will depend on the rate of new infections in the country. It's been three weeks since Chancellor Angela Merkel announced the initial restrictions on contact. Now they're being largely extended. Social distancing rules will remain in place until May 3rd. Groups will remain limited to two people and at least 1.5 metres must be kept from others. From May 4th, schools will gradually reopen, first for school leavers in primary and secondary education. Daycare will remain shut. Religious gatherings will also remain banned, while major events, including Germany's beloved football, will be called off until August 31st. Meanwhile, restaurants, cafes, theatres, cinemas and music venues will keep their shutters down. Only shops up to 800 metres squared can reopen from Monday. Face masks are also being recommended in shops and on transport. Announcing the amended restrictions, Chancellor Angela Merkel warned against complacency. What we've achieved is an interim success. No more and no less. And I emphasize it is a fragile interim success. This has now determined our deliberations that there should be no rushing forward, even if it's with the best intentions. We have to understand that as long as there's no vaccine, we have to live with the virus. Controls along Germany's land borders with its neighbours in the Schengen free travel zone will also remain in place for another 20 days. For now, Germany will continue keeping its distance. The curb may be flattening, but the government, it seems, is taking things slow. All right, for more now, let's pull in our political correspondent, Simon Young. He's on the story for us here in Berlin. Good evening to you, Simon. We know that there is a lot of pressure, there was a lot of pressure on the government to do something. Uh, was today's announcement, was it a surprise to you at all? Well, I think they uh, they might have gone a bit further and sounded a bit more uh, clearly a note that this is the beginning of the way back uh, to some kind of normal life after the coronavirus. Uh, but, of course, as we know, uh, in her many years as Chancellor, Angela Merkel um, tends towards caution anyway, and uh, I think the scientists continue to urge caution in dealing with this pandemic because, uh, as was being said again today, you know, even if there is some easing of the uh, restrictions now, um, there could be uh, bad news from the numbers at some point in the next few months that means that new restrictions have to be imposed. So um, I suppose I'm not entirely surprised that we're seeing a very cautious and step-by-step -step approach. The government is recommending, Simon, that people wear face masks if they take public transportation, and also when they go out in public to go shopping. But they're not making it mandatory. Um, why is it not mandatory if the government thinks it's so important that it should be recommended? Yes, well, you can always have a debate about whether uh, you can actually impose and force people uh, to uh, carry out measures of these kinds. Of course, a lot of people would say it's pretty intrusive having to wear this uh, covering over, over mouth and nose uh, at all times when out in public. But on the other hand, neighbouring Austria has introduced that for a public transport and supermarkets. So that's going to be a recommendation here. I think some people are saying, well, they couldn't really have required people to do it because because we know uh, that uh, obtaining this kind of uh, equipment is uh, difficult during the crisis. Some people have been making their own masks, of course, but uh, it's difficult to, uh, to keep them, uh, make them available to everybody who might need them. So that's part of the reason. And, Simon, is this a, a decision that um, is valid for the entire country? Because we know Germany is a federal country and there are 16 states that they have a lot of authority. Um, so are we going to see the same rules everywhere? 
Well, the, the rules and the recommendations, the plan and the approach is the same for the whole country, but if the actual implementation will vary, in particular in relation to schools. Uh, they're going to start opening at the beginning of May, but uh, uh, Bavaria and some other places may uh, not open until a week or two after that because they want to be a bit more cautious. There will be slight differences in the implementation of some of these new rules, uh, but I think the, uh, the attempt to was to get a, a unified response for all of Germany. Simon Young on the story for us tonight here in Berlin. Simon, thank you. Well, there's been international condemnation of U.S. President Donald Trump's decision to freeze U.S. funding for the World Health Organization. The director of the WHO today expressed regret at Trump's decision and said that this is a time for all countries to unite against a common threat, the coronavirus. President Trump, who himself has been under fire for his handling of the pandemic, accuses the UN body of failing in its early response to the pandemic. The WHO failed in its basic duty to save lives. Those were the words of President Trump as he announced a freeze on funding for the UN agency. Today I'm instructing my administration to halt funding of the World Health Organization while a review is conducted as the organization's leading sponsor, the United States has a duty to insist on full accountability. Trump has repeatedly criticized the WHO throughout the pandemic, this time claiming its bias towards China is responsible for the virus's rapid spread to other parts of the world. Had the WHO done its job to get medical experts into China to objectively assess the situation on the ground, and to call out China's lack of transparency. The outbreak could have been contained at its source with very little death. Trump says the roughly $400 million in annual donations will now be paused. The decision drew a sharp rebuke from the German foreign minister. Heiko Maas said in a tweet, blaming does not help. The virus knows no borders. We should work together closely against COVID-19. One of the best investments is to strengthen the UN, especially the underfunded WHO, for example, in the development and distribution of tests and vaccines. Bill Gates, too, called the move dangerous. The US is the worst affected country in the world, with more recorded cases and deaths than anywhere else. Trump's handling of the pandemic has also been widely criticised. And his opponents say this latest announcement amounts to nothing more than a deflection tactic. Well, as we said, there's been lots of international reaction to Trump's decision. Today, former UK Prime Minister Gordon Brown, who himself is calling for a stronger global response to the pandemic, told DW News what he thinks of the move by the US president. On March the 26th, uh, Donald Trump signed a communique that he was present at the meeting of the G20 when they said they would strengthen the WHO's mandate, they would increase the funding for disaster response, they would give more money so it could develop a new virus, and they would help it deal with the problems facing the developing countries. This is not only an illogical step by the president, it's an act of self-harm, because to protect ourselves locally in Germany or in America, we have to act globally. And if this disease has a second and third round in Africa or in the developing world, and then comes back to the West, uh, then we'll be to blame for not helping those African countries that the WHO is intent on supporting protect themselves when they have underdeveloped health systems and poor so social safety nets and can't adopt the social distancing and other measures that we're adopting in the West. That was former UK Prime Minister Gordon Brown speaking with us earlier today. Here's a look at now at some of the other stories that are making headlines around the world. A 106-year-old woman has been released from the hospital in Britain after recovering from COVID-19. Great-grandmother Connie Titchen is believed to be the country's oldest patient to survive the disease. She said that she felt lucky to survive and that she was hungry after her month-long ordeal. Good for her. The first flight carrying unaccompanied children from Greek migrant camps has arrived in Luxembourg. A number of European countries have agreed to resettle 1,600 children from overcrowded camps on the Greek islands. Germany says it will take 50 of them. Activists have criticized EU governments for not accepting more. 
U.S. Senator Elizabeth Warren has become the latest high-profile Democratic Party figure to endorse Joe Biden to be the party's presidential nominee. Warren, who ended her own bid for the White House last month, announced her support today in a video message. Biden has now been endorsed by all of his former rivals. Well, now to Paris and a story with nothing to do with the coronavirus. A year ago today, the Cathedral of Notre Dame was badly damaged by a fire thought to have been started by an electrical short circuit. Restoration work is months behind schedule, delayed by toxic lead, winter storms, and now, of course, the pandemic. Ahead of the work's completion, two films about the cathedral have been released, one shot before the disaster, the other afterwards, and both enhanced by virtual reality. Take a look. Notre Dame Cathedral, a symbol of Paris in flames. The images from April 2019 saddened the world. Filmmakers Chloé Rochereuil and Victor Agulon had been shooting a documentary on the world-famous landmark just weeks before the fire. The day after the fire, we realized that our images are of extremely great value. We captured a moment in Notre Dame's history that we'll be able to pass on to the public. Whether European, American, Asian or Parisian, everyone who ever visited has a special memory of Notre Dame. They combined footage from before the inferno with newly shot material to make a second documentary titled Rebuilding Notre Dame. Their images of the current cathedral's interior are the only ones of their kind. These images are indeed special because they were shot for virtual reality, that is, in 360 degrees with very high resolution and in 3D. That produces one image for the left eye and one for the right, which gives you the illusion of depth, as if you were actually there. With a VR headset, people can immerse themselves in the world of Notre Dame for 16 minutes. Motion sensors allow them to move through and explore the structure independently. Such an experience in actual reality is no longer possible. Notre Dame is now closed to the public. It's also a tourist landmark that each year drew millions of visitors of any faith or even without one. This is a monument of importance to the history of France. And it was important to us to put that across in our film. The makers of Rebuilding Notre Dame acquired a very rare permit to film inside the damaged cathedral. But in some spots, only one member of the team was allowed, the camera robot. Crumbling walls and high lead contamination posed too great a hazard to people in these areas. Director Chloé Rochereau is delighted that she managed to be in the right place at the right time with the right technology. Yeah, and on this anniversary, just a short while ago, Workers at Notre Dame marked the anniversary by ringing the cathedral's great Bourdon bell. Let's have a listen. <laughs> Sounds that endure a fire and a pandemic. We'll see you again at the top of the hour.